few minutes to do this in R uh, using P norm. So I'm going to open up my R Studio and get this done. Get it? Need more time? Using P norm. Can't get better. Still take a few more minutes. What are you stumbling on with the lab? The Schnabel? Yeah. Yep. That's going to be the thing. Did you try the 95% confidence intervals? Um, yeah. Does it work for me? Yeah, I was just saying, just put in some numbers, make sure it works. I'm going to try your Excel sheet. Or, uh, the, I'll check your <clears throat> That's the one that always takes longer. That's what slows everything down. Hopefully we're done before 5 o'clock this year. Hopefully. Right. Here's our so practice problems. Um, question one was probability of getting value greater than 33 if we have a normal distribution. So cursor here. Right. So that was our question. And, and remember, I said the thing you should always do is just draw that figure. Draw the curve, figure out which area of the curve you're looking for. All right. We know it's to the right, so that's what that's what we're looking at. So I use P norm. It's going to give us the area under the curve. All right, 33 is our target point. Our distribution is a mean of 28, SD of 3.5, and the lower dot tail equals false because we want to the right of that line. All right, we don't want to the left. We want to the right of it. So if I run it, I get a number 0.0766. 0.766. And I think if we looked at it on the table, pull out my sheet from this morning, I came up with 0 0.0764. 0 0.0764. So we had 64 from our table. This had 65 or 
or 6.6. You know, why was it? It's rounding. So when we took that 33 minus 28 and divided by 3.5, we, we had a round it. So slightly different number. Right? Question two was probability of getting a score less than 9. Right, so we said P is X is less than 9. We're working with the normal distribution, 21.7 and 10.2. Right, so here's our, there's our code, P norm of 9. That's our, that's our X, our target. Right, we have our mean and we have our standard deviation. All right, and in this case, we need lower dot tail equals T because we want to the left of that. Again, we drew, drew the curve, looked at it, we identified it. So when we run it, I get 0 0.1065. So again, when we use it, when we did it by hand and used our table, we had uh, 0.1056. Reason for the difference? Again, we rounded. All right? R doesn't have to do that. All right? It's going to take, it's going to calculate the Z, and whatever Z it calculates, that'll get our probability. Next one. We were between 1 and 2. All right? Now, with this, we did a whole slice, and then we subtracted out the smaller slice. That's going to be the same thing that we do here. So this is, again, where we really need to have that, that figure in it. We still have the figure up on the board. All right? So we want the area to the left of 2. All right? So there's our mean and standard deviation. Lower dot tail equals t. So that's our area to the left. All right? And we're going to subtract out the area to the left of 1. Lower dot tail equals t. So in R, it's actually a whole lot easier. We don't have to figure out the negatives. And figure out what, you know, if we have to flip, you know, a value or flip a sign so that we can pull it from the table. We just do larger number to the left minus a smaller number to the left. And when we calculate it, we get 0.5463. And ours was. 0.5475 is what we, we calculated. Again, rounding. It was rounding. Our last one was between two values. Again, it's between 65 and 68. And if you remember when we did this one this morning, you know, there was both negatives. So we kind of flipped it to work in the positive set, tails. We don't have to do that. I'm going to take to the left of 68. That gives me my bigger chunk. All right. I subtract out the area to the left of 65. So I take out the smaller chunk. So, you know, Basically, we had, there's our mean, we took this bigger chunk, and then we figured out the smaller chunk, subtracted that out. So it's, with R, it's actually pretty easy, All right? Any questions? All right, so calculating these probabilities, this is my recommendation. You don't have to do it, but I, I, I do recommend it. Draw a rough sketch of that normal curve. Figure out what slices you're, you're calculating probability of, all right? So you're going to mark it then, and that kind of tells you if you can do it from the table or if you're going to have to take a big chunk and subtract out a smaller chunk. That also helps us keep track of the less than and greater than signs, all right? And... Uh, Again, we already said subtracting out the chunks. Next thing, once we have the area and we know what we're looking for, then we generate our z-scores. In R, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do this. We let R do it for us. All right. And then once we have our probabilities, uh, you can you know compare them to what R gives you, or you know if you calculated them in R, that's just report those. It was or. All right. So big one, that rough sketch of the normal curve. It'll definitely come in handy. All right, so we've been working with the normal curves, but there are deviations from it. All right, so we've got skewness. That's going to change our curve, you know, make it non-normal. And we have kurtosis. So what are these? Skew means that we have uh, excess number of points on one side of, of our mean value. All right, so our normal curve. Our mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. Right? Half our values are to the left, half 
values are to the right, and our left half is a mirror image of our right half. If we have skew, that does not apply anymore. Our left half is not a mirror image of our right half. Now our skew can go in either way. If we skew right, all right, that means we have an excess number of points to the right hand side. Or we've got an excess, excess number of points on the larger side of things. We've got too many big numbers here. All right? And with the too many big numbers, what ends up happening is we get a shape that looks like this. All right? This is marked as positive skew. I say it's skew right. We're skewed towards the larger numbers. And that means that our curve kind of leans to the left. Leans to the left a bit. All right? When we have this case, our mean is going to be larger than our median. And that is going to be larger than our mode. So it's going to kind of stretch our values a bit. If we're skewed left, that means we have more points, smaller points than what we expect. And it's going to draw the tail out towards the left. So on the curve, if we're skewed left, we're going to, our curve is going to be leaning towards the right. All right. In this one, our mean is going to be less than our median, which is less than our mode. Kurtosis refers to peakedness. Right? So the skew returns refers to like which way we're leaning, our asymmetry. Kurtosis refers to peakedness or shoulderedness. All right? Do we have an excess number of points in the peak? Do we have an excess number of points uh, in our shoulders or in our tails? All right. So the two types of kurtosis that we can see is leptokurtic or platykurtic. All right. Leptokurtic is where we have an excess number of of points in our peak and in our tails. All right, so we have less in the shoulders. Uh, so comparison here, just kind of exaggerate a little, a little bit. If we have a normal curve like that, pull this over, make it a little bit closer. All right, so that's our normal curve. If we are leptokurtic, then our curve will look something more like this, where we've got excess number of points in our tails and in the peak. All right, and in our shoulders, we have a deficiency. We don't have as many points there as where we expected. All right, so that's a leptokurtic, very peaked distribution. A platykurtic is something that's going to be excessively flat. So again, just to kind of emphasize this, if that's our normal curve, a platykurtic distribution is something where we have, we don't have enough in our tails or in our peaks because most of our points are excessed in the shoulder regions. All right, so platy, I think a platy is duck-billed platypus. All right, flat, flat build. I, I don't know, that's it. The name stuck with me. All right, so platy kurtic is all of this like elongated and flattened. Leptokurtic is very peaked. All right. Are we able to determine what type of skew or kurtosis we have? Yeah, we do. So, do we have any questions on this first? So, our next step, all of our assumptions. Oh, geez. Sorry, those of you at home, let me move that over. That's what our curves look like. So you've got it on, on the board, good thing I drew it. Um, but all of our, our stats assume normality, right? All right, that allows us to calculate p-values pretty easily. Um, so one of the first things we're going to have to do is check for normality. And you might say, well, let's look at mean and medians see if they're equal. Well, if we're kurtotic here, the mean is equal to the median, all right? And it's equal to the mode. So that's not a reliable method. So what do we have to do? Well, there's a couple different ways in which we can check normality, and that's where we're going to start working with, all right? We don't have any questions. Move on. Next, 
presentation is us assessing normality. Assessing normality. Note that this presentation is not entitled Testing Normality. All right, it's not. And there's a reason for that. Because the test that actually tests normality is really crappy. All right, so our way in which we were gonna set, check normality of data is to assess it. Now there's a couple different ways or why do we have to assess it? And I already said this. It's a, one of our assumptions of almost all the tests that we run, or at least the parametric tests that we run, is that our data are normally distributed. We're going to check that. All right. If they're, if they're not normally distributed and we run our test, there's a chance that whatever we find out is going to be wrong. So we, we will make an error uh, if we use the, the results of that test. The other thing is sometimes we are interested in the skew because it could reveal important biological functions. So if we go out into a lake and catch a bunch of fish, let's say a, a bunch of crappie, and look at our distribution and our sizes, what you would see is that the size distribution of a crappie is skewed. Right? It's skewed. And it's skewed left, leaning to the right. Why is that? Well, it's an important biological function. Yes, younger fish have excess mortality rates. All right, so That ends up taking out individuals leading to this skewed type, type of uh, distribution. So that's changes in mortality rates as an organism age can lead to skewness in our data. Kurtosis could be indication of selection pressures, either strong or weak selection pressures. All right, so in some of the cases, we may be interested in assessing normality to figure out if we're skewed or kurtosis. For us, we're interested in this first one, the assumptions of a parametric statistical test. We always have to check them before we proceed with the test. So how do we check normality? There's two broad categories. One is graphical. We make a figure and we just eyeball it based, based on what we see in the figure. And the second is more of a statistical assessment. Now you could say, well, hold on. We can run a statistical test that gives numbers or we can eyeball it. Shouldn't that test be better? Actually, no, it's not. You're, you're going to see why it's, it's, it's not very good. Right, it's not very good. So what we're, we're going to do is learn all three different types. So with the graphical assessment, we can make histograms and overlay with the normal curve. OK. Not that great. Not, it's, it's OK. That's all it is. It's OK. We're going to look at quantile quantile plots. This is going to be my preferred method, and probably most people's preferred methods. Uh, and then we have statistical assessment, which is shapiro wilkes normality test. So what we're going to do is generate some random data, and we know that it's either going to be normally distributed or it's not going to be normally distributed. So here's our code. All right. So get an R, R markdown document ready. Uh, we are going to get this into R. All right. So open it up. Start a new document. do is pull this up so we can see it and just so you can see the code and you can see what I'm I'm getting ready to do so so I'm going to generate data for this presentation first thing I'm going to do is set the seed why are we setting the seed It's going to be our starting point for that random number generation. Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to do that? Anybody? So we all get the same numbers. Exactly. 
That way, all the figures that we produced during this presentation, you're going to have the same figures in your R Markdown document. All right? So, all right, so I have mine, my chunk ready. I run it. I have, I can see that I generated uh, three different vectors. All right? And just to kind of go through what we're, what these are doing, I'm just going to go through what these are doing right now. So we already talked about setting the seed. So we set dot seed, set it to the same value, 2005. We could have done it something else, but I think 2005 was used when I made the presentation. Uh, all right, so we set our seed, all right, and then we have three vectors. So vector one is yes. So hopefully you can recognize that that will be a normal distribution. We're drawing 200 values from a random normal distribution, that's our R norm, that distribution that we're drawing it from has a mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 5. All right? So uh, here it is. So 200 values from the normal distribution, mean 75, standard deviation of 5. It doesn't have to be 0 or 1. Infinite number of normal distributions. No one is not normal. Right, so this is our first vector that is not going to be normal. We also draw 200 values. All right? The distribution that we draw it from is the F distribution, the random numbers from the F distribution. The F distribution is defined by two degrees of freedom, a DF1 and a DF2. You'll learn about this F distribution when we get to analysis of variance. All right, so with the analysis of variance, our test statistic is the F statistic. That's, we compare that statistic to this F distribution. Named after Fisher, to Ronald Fisher. All right, no two is our second vector. Right. This is also not normal. What distribution do you think this comes from? T, T distribution, right. exactly. So we have a thousand random points now from this T distribution. T distributions are defined by degrees of freedom. So we pick degrees of freedom 10. Now hopefully you may have remembered that I said as our sample size, as our degrees of freedom get large in this T distribution, we approximate a normal distribution. How large? Some people say degrees of freedom of 30 is sufficient. You can look at the T table that I have posted to, to see how close we get. We do get close. We do get close. But a T distribution is a little bit leptocritic. Right? So if we can if we overlay the T in a normal, you're gonna see the T distribution is a little bit more peaked, less shouldered. Right? So that's what we're doing. So first up is our graphical methods, our histograms. All right. What we do is we make a histogram and then we overlay a normal curve based on our data. Now that normal curve is based on our data, which means we have to figure out the mean of our data and the standard deviation of our data in order to get that curve overlaid. All right. Once we do that, then we make a visual inspection. Does it seem like that overlaid curve match? Does it seem to match our histogram, our bars? All right. There's two parts to this code. The first part is to make our histogram. All right. So it, it is to make our histogram. And then the second part, after we make our histogram, then we overlay the curve. All right? And I have this two-part code here. And here, it's highlighted. All right? So if you downloaded the presentation itself, for some reason, the highlight gets lost. So what we need to do is change the variable that we make the histogram of. All right? So we need have to pass it a variable. And oftentimes, that variable is in a data frame. So how do we reference a, a variable in a data frame again? The dollar sign, right? So we'll have to use our data dollar sign variable name. And then the other thing we also have to pay attention to is this breaks, all right? So we have to have a sufficient number of breaks in our histogram to adequately assess that match of the curve to the bars themselves. If we have too many bars, and you'll see some of this, it'll become hard to kind of judge if it's normally distributed or not. We also have to include this frequency equals false. 
And what this does is it, it triggers, should we plot a proportion or should we plot the raw counts? All right, so what we need to do is actually plot the proportions because that is what our D norm function will ultimately use uh, on our overlay. So we're gonna make the histogram and then our second line of code is curve, all right? So the curve is a function that will add a curve. All right, what curve are we adding? We're going to add a D norm curve, all right? Now I have X here and X is there for a reason. You'll note that I did not highlight this and it's for a reason. We don't change this, we're using X. All right, but what we do have to do is calculate the mean of our variable and the standard deviation of the variable. So just like the R norm that we just run, we have to give it a mean, we have to give it a standard deviation. And instead of calculating and typing in the numbers, we're just gonna feed mean of our variable and SD of our variable right into the function. All right, so this is D norm parentheses, X, and then the mean of our variable, SD of our variable, close parentheses, comma, and then add equals t. All right? Now, why is this x stay in x? Because with the curve function, it's going to look at the figure that's already there, and it's going to pull the x from the x-axis of that figure. All right? All right. So, and we can use any distribution here. But for us, we're doing... A normal curve. That's what that's what we're doing. All right. So let's try. So let's use our yes distribution or our, our yes vector. Okay. So all right. Histograms with a normal curve. Overlay. This is a two-part code. So we make a histogram and then add the curve. All right, so using our yes, right? I'm going to do histogram of yes, all right? And when I run this, you will see that this makes a histogram. All right? And what do we notice about? Well, we have six bars, that's it. But how many samples do we actually have in that vector? What was our sample size? 200? 200, 200. All right. Is that enough? Is six enough to capture 200 data points? No, probably not. So what we're gonna need to do is adjust our breaks. So breaks equals, let's start with, uh, let's see here. So if we use 20 with 200 data sets, then we assume we'll probably get an average of 10. Not quite an average because we're because we're going to have more in the middle, but I'm going to say, you know, 10% is a is a good starting point. So I'm going to run it. And I look at that and I say, ooh, that may be a little too much because I'm expecting a peak, and I get a bar that's kind of down low. I get some bars that are kind of up high. So 20 might be a little bit too much. Let's scale it back. Let's try 10 and see if that changes it. 10 looks a little bit better. Right. 10 looks a little bit better. I think I'm going to go with the 10. I've, ban I've smoothed out a lot of the variation uh, in our breaks and our bins, uh, but I've added more bars to really get a feel for if, if we have a couple bins way, having way too many data points or, and so forth. And you'll note here that our frequencies actually count, a count of our data points. That's not what we want. We want, we want it to be a proportion or a density. Okay? Why? Because we're gonna get we're getting ready to use D norm, which is density of our normal distribution. Alright, so we have that. And then what we're going to have to do is add our curve. So our curve function right, is going to use D norm X. All right. So that X there, the curve, is going to say, I'm going to take the D norm, and the X that I'm grabbing is 
the x that is currently on this histogram. That's why it's part of this two, this two part code. We have to have a histogram made before we can run this. And then we want the mean of that yes vector and the SD of that yes vector. Okay, so the D norm is defined by its mean and the standard deviation. We have that, and then we have to do add equals T. Because we want to add that curve to the graphical device that's already in the, in the plot window. So I'm going to check it. And when I run it, I get that. Which is okay. <laughs> Just okay. That's our code. We can run it. How about changing it to blue? That looks better. So COL is color. All right, if I want to change the color of the line, I can do so by saying col equals blue in quotation marks. I could do red. I could do gray. I could do green three. Chartreuse. Same in pink. All right. If I want the line to appear thicker, I can use LWD for line weight. And the default is one. So that blue line is, is has a line weight of one. I'm going to add a line weight of two just for this for this presentation. For most things that get that get printed out in the markdown files, a line weight of one will work sufficiently. But in sometimes in the presentations here, it's kind of sometimes the line's a little too thin for, for those in the back. That works. Pretty cool. All right. What colors can we have? I'm going to pull up my console. Um, I think it's colors. It is. Colors. Let me type, type that. Colors. And then open close parentheses. All right. And when I hit enter, that gives me my list of colors. So I have 657 different colors that I can use. So maybe you want a sienna too. I don't even know what color that is. But these are all the different colors you can refer to by name. If you wanted to refer to their hex values uh, or the RGB colors or the CMYK values, that's also available in R as well. But you can see all, all of these different colors. So you can play around it with you if you want. I mean, we have 100 different grays. If you're curious, or 99 different grays. So it's a little misnomer because you have gray spelled with a G-R-E-Y and then gray spelled with the G-R-A-Y, which are the same. <laughs> but yeah, check it out if you're curious about colors. All right, so we look at this. Uh, how does it how does it look? What's that? Chartreuse just isn't what I expected. No, it's not right. I always had an interest in what chartreuse was. Yeah. It is. It looks greenish, greenish yellow. Oh, yeah. All right. So, uh, what do we say? Does this look normally distributed? Maybe, maybe. Uh, kind of hard to tell. And this is probably this is why I think this is one of the least favorite ways to to look at normality. Now, I'll say I do use it. I do look at normal curves, I'm sorry, I do look at histograms as one of my first steps at looking at data. And I think I told you, the reason I do that is you can identify outliers. So if you type something in wrong, you're gonna have, you know, so if I actually accidentally typed in 6.1 instead of 61, right, my finger slipped, hit the, hit the period, you know, I'm gonna have a bar all the way down here. And I'm gonna say, well, that's not right. So I can always go back, or you know, if I had one too many zeros, if I did 85, but I did accidentally 885, I'm going to have a point way out over there. So I look at histograms. I just don't use them to assess normality. Questions? So this way, kind of difficult to make the assessment. This is the one where it's like the eyeball approach. Mm, it's it's questionable. The better way, and the way that I recommend, 
is to make a quantile quantile plot. All right. So this is it's in the base package. R has the capability to do it. All right. But we're going to use a function that is in the car package. All right. So first up, how do we load the car package? You can check it. And then what do you have to do? Copy the code, paste it into your markdown document so it's loaded anytime you, you, you do it. All right? So we'll see that. All right, qqplot. So once you load the car package, we're going to use the function qqplot. So lowercase q's and then a capital P for plot. Capitalization is important. All right? Then what we have to give it is the vector that we're going to do the QQ plot of. All right. So if it's in a data frame, we use data dollar sign variable name. For us, we, since we just have vectors, we're going to use the vector name. The distribution is optional. The default is to make a normal plot, or to, or to overlay, make your plot comparing quantiles to the normal distribution. And that's going to be basically standard for us. So for our qqplot command, it could just be qqplot and then our variable, all right? And we, we do that. But if you wanted to check, you know, the t distribution, does it fit the t distribution? Does it fit the f distribution? You could with the quantile quantile plot with this qqplot command, all right? As I said, the alternative is to do a two-line code, do a qq norm and then qq line, and that'll make something similar. But we're not going to do that. We're going to use this qqplot. So let's take a look at it. All right, so here's my markdown. All right, I'm going to start down here. So I have, let's see here, quantile, quantile plots. And I'm going to, going to minimize that up. And All right, so quantile quantile plots. We will use the qqplot function found in the car library. Okay. So, first load the library. All right. And Alex said you can go to your packages. Move this up. You can go to your packages, you can find the car, and you can check it. Or, I would like to do just library car. All right? So we're going to load the package first. And if I'm doing this, you know, any sort of stats, and you're going to see this, I'll have a section at the top that says load any libraries here. That way all your libraries get loaded right at the start, and you don't have to worry about saying, ah, did I load it, yes or no, and so forth. So library is loaded. Now, once it's loaded, qqplot is accessible. All right. So we're going to make the qqplot using our yes vector. Or, yeah, yes vector. So qqplot of yes, and I'm going to make it, and we get this plot. What this plot is doing, and I've already mentioned it before when we introduced the normal curve, the normal distribution. This plot plots our quantiles. Uh, it plots our quantiles of the vector versus the quantiles from a normal distribution. All right, so if we're normally distributed, then whatever quantile we're at should match the quantile of the normal distribution, which puts us, all of our points, along a one-to-one -one line. All right. So our quantiles, and I'll do kind of like an extreme case, we have, say, a theoretical normal distribution.
theoretical normal distribution. And then what we'll do is we'll do our skew. All right, and we look like something like that. Well, our normal, if we look at each point and see what quantile we're at as we go up, you know, you're gonna see that we get a rapid increase because we keep adding more and more points. So we may be at, let's say, one per, uh, first quantile, so 1%, 1.1, 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, and then it rapidly gets up until we get to a 50% point, all right? But if we're not normal, then we could be like 1%, and then let's say 1.3%, 1.5%, 6%, and by the time we get to our 50% point, all right, we're not even at our peak. Our 50% point's gonna lie someplace there. So we get a very different increase in our quantiles when we have non-normal data compared to what we should have for a normal distribution. If we're normally distributed, then all of our points will fall along this one-to-one -one line. We get what we expected. If we're not normal, then we don't see this. All right? And what we actually see is deviations from this line. What kind of deviations? There's our one-to-one -one line. We can see something like this. Curvature. Because it means our quantiles aren't, they're not going up as fast as what the normal quantile suggests we should. And then we increase it rapidly. So it could be curved like that. It could be curved the other way. So here's our one-to-one -one line again. Could be curved something like this. And now, our quantiles are, are going up much faster than what the normal distribution states. All right? Or we have some other complex curvature, which looks something like this. All right? Now, this is visual. You do have to kind of eyeball it to assess whether or not we fall, fall on this one-to-one -one line. And that's why I like this QQ plot in the car package. It adds 95% confidence interval. So with these confidence intervals, we look at our individual data points and, and say, if our data points fall outside of that confidence envelope, then we're non-normal. If all of our points fall inside of this confidence, confidence envelope, then we're normally distributed. All right? But there's exceptions, and there's some rules. All right. So as you can see, back this up, in our data points, or this confidence envelope, we are wide at the edges and we narrow down the bulk and then we widen up at the top. Okay, so we've got those at, at home. Wider envelope here and here. All right, and then narrow envelope down the, the, the uh, bulk of our distribution. So our rules say that the bulk of our distribution should fall within this confidence envelope, all right? If we have curvature, if we have curvature of any type, then what we often see is that our points are outside of the envelope in these regions, all right? If we're outside at just the end, the higher low, that's gonna be okay usually. Because those are the regions where you can get, you have a small probability of getting an unusually large value or an unusually small value. I mean, three standard deviation units away, it's unlikely, but it's still possible. And it's those points that will fall outside the line. So our rule, and you'll see it in the presentation, is if we have an excess number of points in those regions, then we can, can, then we can decide you know, non-normality. But what's an excess number of points? It just kind of depends on how many points we have in our data set. If we only have 10 points, and there's only one value that's outside, and it's, it's our smallest value, or it's our largest value, that's not enough to claim significance. If we have five points, and we have a sample size of 100, and those five points occur at the very end, that's not enough. It's not enough evidence of non-normality. But if we have 20 points, and our sample size is of 100, yeah, something's going on there. And chances are, you're gonna see evidence of that curvature. All right? So, what is non-normal here? 
obvious curvature, and you'll see it. It is obviously curved. Our points are falling outside that confidence interval. All right? And then the second thing is an excessive number of points outside of the 95% confidence interval in one or both tails, and the excessive number kind of depends on, on our total sample size. All right? And that's the best I can give you. All right? So these are the yeses. We made these. All right, we made these. Um, so we've already talked about it. I mean, this is what normally distributed vector should look like. All right. So now, just as practice, go ahead and make our histogram and curve and our QQ plot for no, the vector no one, the first one, where we follow the F distribution. Let's kind of see what non-normality starts to look like. in the presentation, you can just copy and paste, but try to use what, what we've done and see if it, see if it works. going. Ready to look at histograms? All right, so histogram of no one. All right, so I copied and pasted the code that was working. All right, copied and pasted the yes vector. 
pasted it into a new chunk, and then I changed and switched from yes to no one. So I've got the hist, I have the curve, it works. Does it look like it's normal? Well, I look at this and I can see I might need a few more bars. Because right now, I do have excess peak here. So I've got too many points in this region, not enough in this region, and then I've got more in this region in our tail. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and increase it. And I got up to 20. And I think that seemed to work out a little bit better. All right. If you use 10 or 20, I, I'm not going to really count off because, again, this is just it's helping you make that assessment. But we can still see, yeah, we have an excess number of points right here. You know, our bars exceed the line. We have, we don't have enough points in this region. Our bars are way below the line. And then we get some of these bars that are way out here. I mean, we're dealing with things that are probably more than three standard deviation unit, three standard deviations away. Probability that that happens is really low, and yet we have quite a few. All right, so looking at this, I can tell, yeah, this looks skewed. This looks skewed. This is probably not normal. Do I rely on histograms, though? Nope, not really. So when I scroll down, oops, yep. So when I scroll down to my QQ plots, all right, so QQ plot, no one. All right, left the default. And then, Now you can really see the non-normality. We have obvious curvature here. Our points curved like that. Curved like that. We curve up. All right. Is it outside of our points? Yeah. It, it, or is it outside of our confidence interval? Yes. And it's not just these endpoints. I mean, out of 200, I can tell right now this is way too many. All right, way too many. Uh, and not only that, these points are outside, these points are outside, and these points are outside. So you may be wondering, well, what does it take to have a point outside of that confidence interval? In R, it's the center of that point. That's what marks it. So we can change the shape of these points if we wanted to. All right, we can make them much smaller to emphasize that they fall out, but I can tell you, that the center of the point is outside of this confidence interval. All right? Like these points here, like, yeah, I've got points that look like they fall out, but the center's inside. All right? The center's inside for those. It may be inside for those. All right? So this is obvious curvature, and I stated that as, as well. So it's obvious curvature. Many points are outside the 95% CI envelope, and those are in the main part of the distribution. This vector is clearly non-normal. This is what we look for. We're looking for something like this to identify non-normality. Here, I added additional explanation. So all points fall within the 95% CI. There's no excess number of points at the ends. Thus, these data are normal. All right? So we looked at number one. Go ahead and make these same things for number two, for vector number two, for no two, I should say. All right. And add in your interpretation.
you get it? I see Lily asked a question, so I'll talk about it when we finish the lecture. I'll answer the question. All right, so histogram number two. So we know it followed a T distribution. We know that. All right. This is what the histogram of the overlay curve looks like. What do you think? Does this look normally distributed? Right? It, I, I see some shoulder shrug. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of the problems with the histograms. I look at this and I could say, yeah, this could be close. This could be close to a normal distribution. I mean, yeah, I could see. I have an excess number at the peak. Is it significant? I don't know. Maybe we have too much. I can see that we seem to be a little bit under. So we're looking for that, that curve to cross the middle of our bar. That's what we're looking for. So I can see, yeah, it looks like we may have a fewer points here in the shoulders. And then, yeah, I can see like one point that's over here, one bin that's more. I can't really judge if this bin is more. I mean, it's hard. I think this is one where I'd look at it and I'd say, yeah, this could very well be normally distributed. And that's a problem, all right? That's a problem because it means that if we use a test that is sensitive to violations of normality, and we still run that test, we could get a wrong answer. We can make an error. This is the benefit of the QQ plots. So here's a QQ plot of no two. We've got 200 points. Look at the number of points that fall outside of that envelope. We got a bunch of them here. You have a bunch of them here. It's probably easy 20 to 30 points. And here's a question. Look at this region right here. I wish I could draw on here. Those points may or may not be outside, but definitely. I look at this, is there obvious curvature? It looks something more like, like that S curve that we drew. So there's our one-to-one -one line. It would look something like this, where our points at the end really fall out. Right? The curve is less, it's not like curved uh, concave up or concave down, it looks more like it's it's got two of them, one of each, so concave down and then concave up. And it's tricky because these points then come back into that confidence interval. But this is one where I, I would see this and I'd say, yeah, I don't think this is normally distributed. It's close, but it's not normally distributed. So if we have a test that's sensitive to that violation, to that assumption, we can't use it. We can't use that test. Any questions right now? So we are almost done here. All right, so that was our, our no one. Uh, and you can see I added some more stuff. I added uh, a legend. All right, so that's how I added a legend. If you're ever curious on how to do it, you've got some code you can play around with. All right, I did an overlay here, not just of the normal curve, so that was our black line, but also the red line to show you that. We were fitting it to, a norm, to an F distribution. We get pretty darn close. So red line is the distribution from which we pulled those random numbers. The black line is the normal curve. There's our violation. You can clearly see it. For histogram two, I did the same thing. All right. Black is normal. Red is T. You can see how we've deviated or how the T distribution deviates from the normal curve and how the histogram would actually be kind of hard to, to detect those deviations, but looking at the QQ plot, we can definitely see it. All right, so the normality test that we have, uh, or the, what we've done is right now the graphical test, and I will tell you the QQ plot is the preferred method. That's our preferred method. What we will do is talk about the Shapiro-Wilkes test and do a quick review of this on Wednesday. Now, before, before we leave, Lily asked, question about the quiz. So the quiz is due today. By the end of the day, uh, I have it set up that it'll show you the score right now, but you can't see the answers. Once the due date passes, and if I, if I look and see that everyone is taking it, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll release it so you can see the questions and the answers and, and what you what you what answers you gave uh, versus, and, and, and so forth. So we'll do that. You will be able to see it. Uh, I also have uh, homework that was posted. All right. Dude, did it. I don't want to. I don't want
don't want it full screen. All right, so I did oops, take off the editing. So you don't see all the stuff that I've hidden. So we had binomial Poisson probabilities. That was the RMD. Um, I have homework number six is more binomial and Poisson. And this one, I just said it's at the end of the week. This is going to give you more practice doing the calculations. But more importantly, this gives you the examples of choose which distribution to use. Don't calculate it, but just choose. Are we using binomial or are we using the Poisson? If you can get through this, this question, this homework, we should be OK for, for the exam. And then I have the normal probability uh, that, that was up. Now, this one says to calculate the probabilities by hand and then check it in R. You can do that if you want. All right, We're, we are using R, and all, all the, the quizzes will be on the computer. I can't say don't use R. All right, so uh, if you want to do it by hand and use R to check, you can. If you just want to use R, you can. All right, but you do know I will ask you, like, give you a situation and then say, what's the Z score? All right, calculate the Z score. So I will ask you to do that on the exam. All right, so you have to know how to do the x minus the mu divided by, divided by s. That will reappear, believe it or not. All right, so those, that's posted. I did say for the normal curve, go ahead, uh, have it due on Wednesday. End of the day on Wednesday, so you can work through it, just kind of reinforce what we've done, what we've done today. This more binomial and Poisson, I just said by the end of the week. All right, by the end of the week, if you, if you can do that. Um, what's that? Five is due. I think it was due to today. I think. Is that what I did? I guess I'm gonna have to unclick it. Let's see here. Uh, edit. Oh, I didn't do it due day. I guess we can make that due on Wednesday. It's all, it's all practice. It's all giving you more repetition to get you comfortable doing this. All right? So yeah, I just arbitrarily had a few dates. I don't know what end of day means. I don't know if that's 11.59 or what. I've been afraid to pick it. Um, but yeah, we did the binomial Poisson. And some people have already did it. They already did it last week. But it's meant, again, you're going to be assessed on that. Uh, speaking of assessment, have any of you looked at our next exam date? I'm glad I looked at it because <laughs> it's supposed to be on Monday. It's supposed to be on Monday. So I have a hard time postponing it because I know what, what, we're, what we're doing, what's coming up. So you're going to see you know, this method of assessment, we are basically almost done with, with this. Um, so we kind of go through, you know, I show you how to do the sample sizes again because our sample size for the Shapiro-Wilkes is important. All right, but we're going to easily finish this on Wednesday. Easily finish this on Wednesday and that means our next presentation is hypothesis testing and competence in um, and this hypothesis test. Uh, we introduced hypothesis tests, so more definitions, and, and then I show you kind of how to how we generated some of the p values. All right, like where we're getting p values, and, and talk about type one, type two errors. Uh, this is all a lot theoretical, so it's, it's more lecture, and I kind of think we're going to be getting to this on Friday. Um, so I know on our on our exam, we normally have standard error and confidence intervals. I don't think that's going to be on the exam, so we're still going to keep the exam on Monday, and it'll basically be probabilities, so, all right? Assessing normality too, so demonstrating that you can assess normality. We'll just keep keep plugging. Um, what we'll probably do is we'll probably need to have class on Monday, at least say at 11 o'clock, uh, but we'll, we'll cancel the lab. The lab will be time if you want to come in and work on the exam at that time. All right? All 
All right. I'm going to say no confidence intervals because you will, we really won't have the time to have any homework. It's due. All right. Have a good day. Have a good one.